real literary analyst for the Christian New Testament was somebody called Paul Floyd Maptus. He lived about the year 300 of the Common Era, and he wrote a 15-volume critical commentary on the New Testament Gospels, which suggested that they were literary creations. For example, he suggested that the Gospel of Mark was modelled on Homer, and one of the pieces of evidence that he used was that in the Gospel of Mark, instead of calling the Gennesaret the Lake of Galilee, Mark calls it the Sea of Galilee, and his inserted extra voyages on the water uh, made the storm more like a sea. So all of those things makes it um, more likely that he was actually using Homer. And of course, the church was very threatened by Paul Fry's work. Uh, it was all burnt. We've only got a few fragments left that survive. But we've got enough to see what he was doing. He was showing that the Gospels are literary creations and not works of history. I and mean, the social scientists and social scientists look at literature. Um, they do so by studying the structures. They look at how the, the texts were created and how they were edited and how the social communities and political environments um, produced them and how they relate intertextually to other documents. And then you look at how they were rewritten, how they were used by various power brokers. Um, texts aren't neutral things. They're, they're always um, instruments of social power. So, Literary analysts and literary analysis never just looks at the surface. It always um, looks deep into the text and sees how the text is produced by people with an agenda. And if you then apply that to the Gospels, well, the winners write history, and the Romans were the winners of the Jewish war, and they wrote both the Gospels and the other New Testament texts. And they did so to reflect their own agendas and their own strategic ideologies and their own needs. And you, one of the reasons we have so many manuscripts of the, the Gospels, unlike other, other, other texts, is that the Romans wanted them to be widely available. Um, if you look at the authentic Jewish documents of the period, the only ones that survived were the, the scrolls buried in the caves of Qumran, where the Romans couldn't get at them. So today, the, the Gospel texts are still being used, and they're being used in the same way that the Romans intended. They're being used to control and manipulate people and stop them for thinking for themselves and enabling them to obey their leaders, all the things that the Romans designed. Okay, let me back backtrack a little. Um, as you know, the, the, the Roman Jewish War, uh, 66 to 70 of the Common Era, was fought by two generals, um, Vespasian and his son, General Titus, and they um, used their success in, in the Middle East in order to rally popular support in Rome and stage a military coup after, after the, the, the year of the four emperors. And um, Vespasian became the first of the new dynasty of, of, of Flavian emperors, and he was then succeeded by his son, his eldest son Titus, and then by his youngest son Domitian. And the problem that the Roman emperors had, that the Flavians had, in creating this new dynasty was how to legitimate the dynasty by useful myths and propaganda. And in the case of their relationships with, with the Jews, they had to offer an alternative to the Jews, which would act as an alternative to, to traditional Jewish stories. And they needed to trick them into worshipping a different sort of messiah, a false literary messiah, um, who would really be seated in the skies. Romans wanted people to believe there was a historical Jesus. That was their, their own intention, to, to trick and deceive the Jews into accepting their um, imitation, pro-Roman version of the Torah. And unfortunately, Dyer fell for it. He was unfortunately very naive and ignorant, and he took the Gospels on face value instead of subjecting them to detailed literary criticism. So he was basically fooled by what is really Roman war propaganda, and he isn't alone. And as for the Talmud, um, that was really written 200 years later, so that alone makes it really um, not something that comes in as evidence. But traditionally, Jews have always argued, for instance, in the disputations in the, the 13th and 14th century, that the, the texts of the Talmud refer to somebody else when they refer to Jesus, and that's the view I take as well. So if you're talking about the, the, the figure of the, the Jesus figure as described in the Gospels, there is absolutely no independent historical or archaeological evidence whatsoever for, for, for that figure. Indeed, to the contrary, there's a vast amount of information uh, that evidence showing that that figure was created entirely as a literary character, and he was created for deliberate anti-Semitic reasons. And you can see how, how it was created. 70% of the character was created through Midrash or existing uh, traditional stories, um, about 10% by using materials on cynic philosophers, and about 20% by drawing on events that actually took place during the Jewish War, actually during Titus Caesar's campaign from the year 66 onwards, as Joseph Atwell, my colleague, shows in his book Caesar's Messiah. Um, so, so the evidence is, is really very, very clear that he was created as a, a literary character drawing on these specific sources. And the, the, the biggest piece of supposed historical evidence for, for, his, for the existence of the historical Jesus is something called the, the Testimonium Flavinianum, um, which uh, my colleague Joseph Atwell has actually shown is completely the opposite. It's actually a confession by the Flavian emperors that they invented the whole thing as a fraud. Their priority was that they just had this very disastrous war. The Middle East was, 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 was devastated. The economy was in terrible shape. Um, they had to calm down the economy in the Middle East and make the Jews pay, pay taxes and make the Jews worship Caesar as Lord. And they did this um, the way, same sort of way they did right across the empire, by taking over the name of one of the local Hebrew religious figures, namely the Messiah, and they used it as a disguise for providing a literary account of Caesar that lay underneath. 
This is actually the same strategy they used everywhere through the empire to disguise Caesar uh, uh, as, a lo as a local deity. And that was the way that the Caesar cult worked, and that was the cult that united the empire. They were trying to create a sort of comic cartoon um, version of the Torah, because they, they burned the existing Torah, so they wanted to be, had to give the Jews something, so they were creating like this, this, this imitation Torah. Um, you talked earlier about, about Roman values. Well, the Gospels teach Jews to pay taxes, to honor Caesar, to give up on laws like circumcision, to give up on the Mosaic law, um, to be obedient, not to find enemies, to work on Shabbat, to help the, the occupying army by carrying their backpacks and twice as far as, as the law requires. Hey, what, what do you conclude from this? Uh, uh, these are Roman values. Um, a traditional Jewish text would, for example, talk about freeing slaves and prisoners. But the Gospel texts never talk about freeing slaves because Rome was a slave-based society. And um, the Gospels talk about visiting prisoners and feeding them in order to save the same money. They don't talk about freeing them. It's very important. The Gospel that we have to have it um, reflects Roman values of slavery and death and torture. And Rome reminds us of Rome's expertise as crossbuilders. Um, creating this, this fake Jewish society to instruct the Jews to submit to Rome in all these ways. From a Roman point of view, this was very, very funny. It's highly comic. Well, they couldn't call it Torah, could they? They had, they had to prevent it. <laughs> the, the, reason, the word gospel in Greek is evangelion, and it means literally good news and military victory. And nobody has been able to explain this. People have tried all sorts of reasons for the last 2,000 years. But now the reason is very obvious. So as my, my colleague Joe Apple, um, his book Season Messiah, shows that the key, uh, the key 11 or 12 events in the life of Jesus are literary satires of events that really took place, but they, they took place in the lives of Titus Caesar, and they are they battles in which the Jews actually lost. So the good news of military battles victory refers to the fact that the Romans won those battles over the Jews and created these literary satires and have now created this, this way of humiliating the Jews by educating them to believe that the battles in which they've been defeated are good news. Now this will sound strange, but this is what the Romans thought, thought about revenge. The, the, the playwright, the philosopher Seneca writes about it. The Romans were determined that the Gospels would humiliate the Jews and force them to accept a fake version of their own history. It was part of the Roman takeover of Jewish culture. That's what it was. Because the Romans have tried for a hundred years to explicitly to get the Jews to worship Caesar, as you know, they, they, they tried everything. Um, Emperor Caligula tried putting a statue in the temple, and Jews um, had, had fought for, for the decades. Uh, the Jews would rather die first. So the, the Romans knew they couldn't get the, the Jews to, to worship Caesar um, by, by force, but they could do it covertly by trickery, by creating something that looked on the surface like a Jewish document, but that really wasn't. So it was a way of tricking the Jews into accepting all these teachings by making the gospel appear to be the genuine record of a historic religious re leader 40 years before. And they did it by deception. And this is not strange. The Romans um, were good at writing false histories. There are several other cases where they did it. They found it amusing. Um, and this is the way that propaganda works. It works by concealing its true authorship. And if we look around even today, the world is full of um, propaganda. And the Gospels are fake news and fake history. They're just 2,000 years old. OK, so we're getting into the deep. Well, the first version that the Romans created is something we know as the Gospel of Matthew. And this is the largest book of the Christian New Testament. Um, there is something the Bible scholars call the two document hypothesis, which has been really great work done by Professor Peabody at the International Institute for Gospel Studies. And according to them, which I agree with, um, this was the first of the Gospels to be written. Um, I agree with that, even though there was an earlier draft as well. Well, there, there is actually this, this draft called the Gospel of Peter that not many people know about, but it was clearly um, set, at, set at the time of the, the uh, last days of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is burning in the background. But it's also clearly uh, not historic, it's a fantastic satire because it's a mile high cross with you know which which which, which goes up into the clouds and which follows people around. I mean this is a fantasy. Um, it's a fantasy literature. Um, but then the Romans decided to make it um, more realistic instead. Okay, well in my view the Gospel of Matthew is the most anti-Semitic document probably have ever written because it was written as, as a comic parody of, of the Torah. And we know that it was written as a replacement Torah for, 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 for two two things. Firstly because of its content and secondly because of its structure. Um, both of these things show that it was not written as history, but as a literary parody. It's long been known for many years that the Gospel of Matthew is divided into five books, just like the books of the Torah. It, it starts with an account like that of Genesis, then goes on to an account like that of Exodus, and another like Numbers. And then the bulk of the Gospel is like the book of Deuteronomy, and it concludes with a piece that is like Leviticus. Um, so it's very like the Torah, except that the order of the books is different. Now, now my work um, has been to point out some unrecognized features that finally prove um, that the Romans were written it as a deliberate parody. We can look through some examples if you like. Okay, um, well the, the whole central part of the Gospel of Matthew is, uh, is like a parody of Deuteronomy, the, the set part of the Rim, um, from its initial phrase, these are the words. Uh, this is similar to Matthew's initial phrase in chapter 4, verse 17, from that time forth Jesus began to say these words. And like the five speeches by Moses in Deuteronomy, it's organized throughout the series of five great teachings given on the mountain. Surprise, surprise. Each of which concludes with the very former, it's right at the end, just like, just like Deuteronomy. So it's very clear. 
like all of them, this was also a literary parody. My great teacher, English anthropologist Mary Douglas, has shown me in her book on the Odysseus that the different chapters move in succession around the walls of the courtyard of the tabernacle before approaching the ark. And there are two episodes of blasphemy, one of the sons of Aaron in front of the door, and the other account of the blasphemer in front of the curtain in chapter 24, where just, just, just coincidentally, the last part of Matthew moves around the temple in exactly the same way, and Jesus is twice accused of blasphemy at exactly the equivalent places in front of the two entranceways. So this is absolute proof. The entire account is, is a literary anti-Semitic joke. It's a parody. I'd be happy to give you some examples of content. Perhaps the best example uh, is, is a person of Russia, the Moses. Um, this is a very good book on this by Dale Anderson. Uh, the writer of the Gospels took the key events in the life of Moses, as described in the Torah, and created satirical equivalents to appear in this fictional life of Jesus. And the sequence even appears in exactly the same order, so you can tell that's how it was created. But what they then did was take another dozen events from the, from the life of the, the Emperor Titus in his campaigns in Judea, and added those in as well to show who the true saviour of Israel was. Okay, well, these, these are the synoptic gospels. Um, these are also literary creations. Uh, they're, they're not independent documents. Um, what they are is they're rewritings of Matthew based on different literary models. So, for example, Mark is a re rewriting of the Gospel of Matthew that uses the conventions of, um, of, of Homer to make it look like, like a Greek epic. Greek. And it's directly based on that, and there's a lot of work on that. There's like Professor McDonald from California. And, and then, then, then Luke um, is. is um, Again, based on Matthew, but rewritten according to um, the conventions of the Roman epic, namely Virgil, using the Aeneid. So both of these things um, were rewritings of Matthew um, according to different classical models. Um, and they were written them this way so that, um, taken together, you had Matthew as, 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 a Jew, as a Jewish epic, and then you had a Greek and Roman epic as well. The three different versions. Well, of course, the, the, the Akiva appears in the Torah in, in Genesis 22. Um, and originally, when Matthew was written, um, and the passage about the baptism was written, uh, there was nothing about the Akiva in it. Um, the Romans didn't include it first time round. But then, when they, when they rewrote it, when Mark rewrote the second edition, Mark does remodel Matthew's story of the wilderness to provide a version of the Akiva. Um, I'm getting into some very technical detail if you want. Um, okay. In Matthew's original account of the baptism, there's a voice and the heaven are described as opening, but Mark doesn't use the word opening, instead he uses the word splitting schism. Uh, then he adds in the words, and it happened um, to begin the story, and he tells the reader specifically that Jesus saw the splitting of the heavens. So Mark, the reason Mark does this is he's taking the words straight from the, the Greek, from the Septuagint, again, straight from the story that came up. So he is de deliberately creating it as a parody because that account in, in the Septuagint also begins with these words, and it happened. In, describes Abraham, who split the wood for the fire and was called out from heaven and placed his name the Lord will see. So Mark is creating several different parallels in order to present Jesus as a, representative, as a replacement for Isaac. Okay, well, I, I, I get once more, as I just said, that there's nothing, there's nothing about the Akeda um, in, in Matthew, um, I, think the, I think the baptism story, all the crucifixion story. But yet again, uh, when Mark did his rewriting of, of Matthew's crucifixion story, yes, he did, he did add in elements of the Akeda, um, if he did so in a very subtle way that reflects Roman anti Semitic humour. As you know very well, I mean, the Torah, of course, Isaac had two sons here. He saw the red hair, and Jacob, who was Israel, the soldier of God. And you remember how Isaac obviously carries the wood to the altar. Well, in Matthew's crucifixion account, there was a man who carried the wood to the cross, and he's called Simon. So this actually carried the wood that makes Simon a little bit like Isaac. But the author of Mark then makes him even more like Isaac, like he had a son, Rufus, the red hair, and another, Alexander, which means protector of mankind. It's all in Mark 21. Uh, Mark 15, 21. And this is Roman humour, since these just happen to be the names of the Roman generals. And during the Jewish War, Rufus was the Roman general who helped crucify the true Jewish Messiah. And Tiberius Alexander was the other general who crucified the sons of the freedom fighter Judas. So the, the Roman generals who crucified the Jews are being given cameo appearances in this rewriting of the epic as Esau and Jacob and Israel. Instead of featuring, featuring Israel, the soldier of God, the gospel features Tiberius Alexander, the Roman general who was known for slaughtering Jews in Alexandria. The Romans must have thought this was hilariously funny. This is why they're uh, the most anti Semitic documents. And then after after the Gospels were written, like a generation later, there was a whole um, secondary literature of commentaries like the Epistle of Barnabas, which tried to uh, spell out the message and claim that in, in the crucifixion, Jesus offered the, the vessel of his spirit as a sacrifice for our sins and was a type of vice. But that's all secondary literature. Um, what, what, what I can say is that now that we know that the, the Gospels are a comic parody of Judaism, and created by the man who, who destroyed the Jerusalem to make people worship him in a concealed Caesar cult, I mean, can we just stand by and do nothing? And it's the, religion that the Emperor Titus has created continues to devastate our world, you know, 2,000 years later. I, I believe that we all have the, the ethical and moral responsibility to learn how to read these ancient texts and to understand what they are and to use our modern media, like, like you're doing on this program, to make sure that the truth is known and to prevent further damage to our world. So what do you have to do? Well, go and study, ask questions, teach the truth.